The His Girl Friday podcast is brought to you in part by Messenger Fellowship, living the kingdom, fulfilling the call, proclaiming the truth. How's it going, everyone? This is yours truly, Cameron Fry. His Girl Friday coming at you. It's Thursday night, June 23rd. I believe this is the first podcast I'm cutting this month. That just tells you how crazy life has been. But I've gotten to the point where, you know, even if I'm only producing one post, a blog post and or pod to accommodate, I'll take it just to kind of keep up some stream of continuity. It's it's not that life has been brutal. It's just been taxing. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know, personnel changes at work, which we've all been there and having to carry more responsibility and you get home and you have side hustles, you have family life, you have NICU life, that's still going uh, for those tracking uh, our Juby journey. We are in month 10, officially as of two days ago, and um, we're hoping that Juby can come home ahead of her first year birthday on August 21st. Uh, the dead, I guess her homecoming date has been pushed back time and time again. We don't even know what to think, but we know that she's in a good place, you know, two, two and a half months since her tracheostomy, we're just learning the ropes of how to be independent as parents, speaking of Liz and I, and um, being trained, and we, you know, we have some, there's a certain checklist of requirements we must tackle before they could admit her, so that's just, in a nutshell, where we're at with Jubilee, this year of Jubilee. So tonight, I'll just pivot, jump right in. I was driving home from work last week. Actually, I think it was last Thursday around this time. And I just had this conviction of just this tendency, this this peeve, <laughs> uh, this negative knack, if you will. Just I empower the past in subtle ways. And... The good news is, is that as I mature, I'm catching myself doing it closer to the moment. The bad news is, is that the intensity of the habit hasn't waned at all. It's still kind of this load, this overwhelming monkey slash white elephant in the room. And I'm going to get to some more specifics on how I do that. Because there's many ways. But it just led me to find the title of this post relatively quickly. We're going with the struggle is nil. Why surrender is hard at its core. It's hardcore and it's hard at its core. So a double pun in eight words or less. And much of my ponderings lately have come from a familiar place, having to Consider the challenges of juggling family, vocational, and liturgical responsibilities. For some, family and vocational is enough. And I know that for most, even then, those categories represent, well, you know, the majority, but certainly not all. There's a lot of things we're juggling day in and day out. Now, for me, my greatest passion, and I've said this before on here, helping marketplace leaders balance the sacred and secular while discovering their influence within their spiritual gift mix. That is the baseline, the bottom line. I don't see that changing anytime soon. And it's really not just marketplace. It's really, you know, we're all leaders. It really could be anybody, uh, but especially those who are in business, who have an occup- you know, an occupational slash vocational calling, which I, can't, I could bring that out to anyone, but um, those who are specifically breadwinning for their families, um, all the way to those who are having to handle and juggle multiple responsibilities to make ends meet. There's a lot going on in the world today, and we're all having, you know, we, we all feel the extra pressure and the weight to keep up with the changes, uh, not just economically and financially, but also even politically and socially. And of course, there's ethics and expectations, uh, you know, the the chiseling away of our moral fiber as a society, as a culture. We're having to 
have conversations at younger ages with this next generation. Um, and again, this is not why we're here tonight, but certainly it's fresh on my mind of having to, you know, have some important discussions with my kids, you know, my four-year-old and my six-year-old and blown away at the fact that I have to have my facts, have, have my truths in order. And it's hard not to compare and contrast how life was when you were young, when you were growing up in the prime of childhood. And again, I speak as a dad who is in his mid thirties. I have four under six right now. And, um, I filter my worldview through their upbringing and what they're discovering. It's like, I get to be sort of a kid living through their eyes, through their lens, but in in a way it's hard to do that because it's such a radically different world. And sometimes I get a little disappointed myself for not being able to provide more for them. But again, times are just tough and we all feel it in different ways. And I'm curious to see, you know, what your chaos looks like, what your crisis looks like, what your challenges look like. If I'm being straight up honest with you, I'm finding this calling, my calling to inspire business leaders, marketplace leaders, whatever you want to call them, in terms of finding their prophetic and pastoral anointing, or you know, their priestly identity, I should say. That calling, it's been more difficult than I could have ever imagined this year. And in fewer words, I could cite career adjustments, pandemic troubleshootings in 2020, as mentioned, the Jubilee journey, which kicked off last August, these are all justifiable narratives as to why I'm maybe not more heavily involved in ministry right now. But that doesn't even come close to scratching the itch of what is really going on and what lies beneath. Insecurities in the closet, anxiety swept under the rug, fears of bait yet preserved toleration. I mean, those are just to name a few. And perhaps time will permit me to unpack that series in greater detail. For now, what I will say, as I mentioned earlier, as we, as we hit new strides in an unsettling world, as we tackle new endeavors, we explore new endeavors, we pursue new pathways, hopefully divinely inspired and led. Whatever we do, let's not empower the past by assuming God can't do a new thing in familiar settings. And let's not, as a corollary, let's not assume that the way out of our struggle is to make that new thing, to pivot away from a familiar setting, to assume that what is familiar is evil, is wrong, is less than, is not God's highest, it's probably more the latter. We we so assume God's highest, don't we? (laughs) We don't even realize, I don't think we try to, we can admit the reality of Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, that God is perfect and accordingly his ways his thoughts are higher everything about him is higher and that's good we should want to reach up to him we should want him to be so far greater how great is our god i don't i don't want any closeness apart from his presence apart from his love apart from his nature i mean i want him to be so much further and greater and higher than myself but empowering the past getting into this conviction it's you know, I have to ask myself, why am I so resistant in certain ways to engage God's people, to, to, to engage, you know, not just my tribe, but those God has put in my life for a reason. It's like I, I show up to work because in many ways I have to. Um, I don't want to say attrition, but there is a there's just a a calling and a responsibility to be a vocational period, not just a leader, but just someone who shows up and it's, it's providing for my family. Yes, but it's also fulfilling God's purposes in my life in a specific arena, you know, for a specific employer. But in other circles, I haven't been as committed. I certainly want to be, but the hesitancy, I have to, what I'm doing now is letting myself be curious 
as to why I do certain things and don't do other things. I am curious about the walls I set up. I'm curious about what it would take to for them to come down. What life would look like. I'm daring to consider life without certain fears in play, even though I know that I'm wrestling with them now. There's been some setbacks and a lot that I can't control. Ones I've already mentioned. You know, 2020 was my, you know, I was a rookie at a new job. I was learning the ropes. The pandemic hit and, we, you know, we had to learn how to work remote. It was a brave new world. Everything was new. And so many justifiable reasons were laid out as far as why community was so hard to engage. And now we're learning to adjust. And, yeah, you know, I've never, what, it's been almost two and a half years since the pandemic started. We have settled in and the challenges, there's still plenty, plenty of turmoil and unrest. That is new, um, going back to last year and also this year. I don't want what I can't control to be an excuse though, if that makes sense. I'm tired of the excuses that I put up with, that I tolerate, that keep me away from God's courts. I want to have the praise, you know, sometimes I'm too content to be outside of his courts and praising and worshiping. And, you know, that's where I want to, in, in many ways, be, you know, you want to be light in the darkness. You want to be salt um, to the, the bland places of this life, to those who need that flavor of God in their midst. But I'm also not allowing myself to be charged. I feel as a man without flame, and I know some of you listening to this feel the same way. I haven't put myself in position really in several years to really be ignited. I'm trying to do that by myself in a lot of ways. and I'm finding just how futile that is. Again, just being honest. Now, for some of you, this is not a struggle, but to me, this can be tough. In fact, I would submit the wrestling while worth it from a perseverance perspective, is ironic. As we grow through life, as we war through the ups and downs, so do our laundry lists grow of what we wish we could have done differently. I look at my life between the ages of 20 and 25, and I see a double-minded Christian meandering like a chicken with his head cut off. (laughs) I can't stand that version of myself. I also look at 26 to 32 and see someone who had recommitted his life to Christ, who aligned, but too, too much personally and could have been more consistent as a leader. I look back and I think about some of the thoughts that I had, some of the decisions I made, and uh, even some of the reactions. And I'm just like, I can't relate to that guy anymore. And it feels encouraging in a sense, but uh, you know, it, it's almost like who we were in the past is this different person. And we're confused with ourselves, but really, it's an older version of ourselves, but it almost feels like we're having to show grace and compassion again to a different person. It it feels weird, (laughs) for lack of a better word. And it's good to go back and show grace and compassion. Basically, you're, you're being the heart of Jesus to who you used to be. And it's a great tactic that I employ to move on and re move on. But again, all is easier said than done. I, you know, after years of counseling, it certainly helped. Spot start ministerial assignments since then. Nothing really consistent since my legacy youth, youth pastoral days. I'm ready to get back into the game again. Not to stop working where I'm at, but to, you know, there, there's certain, there's a part of me that really wants to plug back into the church and know what it's like to be in fellowship with the saints again. I as far as church is family, it's, if I'm being honest, it's, that's been the exception, not the norm. I'm craving that, but I also know I need to crave the reason for church, the God who called church to be salt and light in the darkness, the people that make up his body. (laughs) You're getting into the reasons why we exist. That's what I'm ultimately craving. My relationship with God is one that you know, there's many quiet times. There's plenty of Bible reading and prayer and doing the right thing. But sometimes it just feels like um, it's faith on paper more than anything else. And it's I get back and it's just I am stiff-arming even 
the Almighty, <laughs> the sweet divine. There's a little bit of stiff arming action. Like, don't get too close because I can't handle being close to. I do have a hard time with intimacy. Again, another conversation for another day. The problem is, in a lot of this, is while I am getting, I'm feeling ready to get back into the swing of things from a liturgical perspective, the problem is my hands are tied by what I can't control, and that's okay. One of the reasons why I'm recording this podcast is to let you know that there's plenty that you, you know, we can't control, from gas prices to the Russia-Ukraine situation to local and political unrest in our own culture, uh, you know, from the White House to, you know, gun control, the, you know, the mass shooting epidemic that's going on. And, you know, you certainly could cite more, but there's so much that we can't, you know, we we can facilitate and inspire change as far as it be with us, but there's still plenty of that by ourselves we can't control. And we got to get back to just knowing that that is okay. What's not okay is the propensity that we sometimes fall prey to, myself included. I am pointing the finger at myself as I record this. It has defining relationships by emotional impressions. Defining relationships by emotional impressions. By this, I'm referencing the practice of perceiving a person through the greatest internal reaction they've elicited, be it a single moment or repeated pattern. For instance... Within a single connection, there may be nine positive interactions. However, if the tenth provokes a strong negative response, seen or unseen, we may taint the entire association to the point of withdrawal. This is a self-preservation tactic that I, with confidence, not, you know, I suppose it should be shame, but I don't mind admitting to this fault. As soon, like, I'll take inventory, I'll create these checkpoints, and I'll take inventory at those checkpoints with people. And after a year or two, maybe more, I realize, wow, there's too much baggage here, or the, you know, maybe there's numerically more pros and cons, but there's just too much that I wish didn't happen. I will move on, and I don't want, and, and I want to be in control, I don't want to manipulate the person, but I certainly want to control the outcome. And that is before, you know, I'm not going to keep going. I don't want to potentially be rejected by this person. And I will, without saying anything, I will just disappear into the night. It's a blind home of rejection. We don't, again, we don't want to think of it as that. We just want to disappear. We just want it to just go away. We just wish, if we can't make something as if it never happened, then that's like the next best thing, right? It's just to make sure that, you know, we stop the bleeding. We, we draw a line in the sand and be like, I ain't going back. We do that all the time. And we manufacture the resets. And this is why so many people, like, it's that reason why a lot of people leave the church hurt, wounded, and they don't realize it, but they're sustaining this pattern of showing up because there's a, there's a desire to be plugged in and engaged in community, um, to be a part of something, to have that purpose activated. But then they you know, after a year or two, they spiral away, they, they fade, they withdraw, they isolate, or just they, they are looking for someone to knock on their door, and that knock is never going to happen. It, it might, but, you know, if we're looking for that, then it's not going to happen nearly enough. We, we have to be selfless. <laughs> we have to be willing to go out and remember that it's not about us and feeling fed and feeling even blessed like we have to know we're blessed we have to re- respond out of that and be like i'm gonna love i am loved i am cherished i'm gonna extend that to someone else it's getting out of our getting out of ourselves and getting out of our comfort zones and i think a lot of there's a lot of good messages and teachings about that it's the tip of the iceberg though and to me it's like okay it's great to admit that but i feel like we're trying to a lot of times that type of content, we're capturing the ideal, but we're not encouraging people to explore their curiosity, to to examine themselves, giving them the tools to do that and ask why. It's not so much a why to God, but it's just being introspective. It's here's my fallenness, here's my depravity. It's coming face to face with it and 
it's being fearless in the face of that. Like, okay, I already know I'm fallen. I already know I've had issues. I know that I fall short of the glory of God, that every day I make mistakes. And, you know, really, you know, while there's communion at church, I should be taking communion with God every day to remember the cross in, in light of the good, bad, and the ugly, right? But getting back to the self-preservation tactic, we do it all the time. A lot of us do it. Some derivative of it anyway. And the issue with this mindset ties to our natural minds. We need God. And one of the reasons we need him is because we need holy parameters and godly beliefs to govern us, to shape us, to conform us, to transform us. Without a supreme being, how can our you know, how can we scale our emotions? How can we weigh situations accurately? How we can assess what is good, what is not, what is truth, what is deception. And in this context, we are going to scale the magnitude of these social moments incorrectly almost every time. You know, it's if, if for every 10 positives there's a negative, we're going to blow up that negative because of our fallenness, because of our sinful nature. When really we should minimize that, that mountain we create out of that molehill. I mean, it's, we basically invert everything. And if we're not sensitive to the spirit to surrender at the point of awareness, that snowball is only going to get bigger. That habit we feel, I mean, ultimately it's like, how can we have a relationship with anybody if we do that? Some of us were content with just a few, a handful of close friends, and I am that way. But I also know that, you know, a core group of guys, that's been mostly missed and hit. I mean, up until, you know, up until 20, I'd say I, there was always a, a, cl- a close new group of guys I can hang with and, and be transparent and, and vulnerable and share what was going on and then college came, that 20 to 25, and nothing's really, some things have just not come back around since the dark ages, as I call them, i.e. between 20 and 25. And um, in fact, one of the reasons, one of the, one of the stories that come to mind when I talk about my struggle to scale positive versus negative social reactions, or um, rather, defining moments and uh, emotional impressions, the struggle to gauge and scale emotional impressions comes back to a situation like about a decade ago when I was challenged by someone in the church, my sexual orientation, and it was done in a condescending way. And I, um, it really affected me, really hurt me. And a couple of years after that, a separate situation of just a fellow leader who just, you know, blasted me and, and never, and while there was some, there was definitely a legit reason why someone was confronting me. It was just done so poorly and thought that I was trying to be sneaky and didn't anticipate that I was just acting out of ignorance, not arrogance, that I just was a new leader and just could have handled things better. But just instead of saying, hey, next time do this, it was just, I got completely slaughtered. And to this day, that leader has not said sorry to me. The two stories that happened between t- 10 and 12 years ago. Now I look back and I think about, you know, who I was hanging with. I was hanging with many wrong crowds um, in my early 20s, but I don't know. It still, it, it can irk me. Like, I'm using these as examples of why I can be so hesitant to want to be, even in healthy circles, because I'm just, I don't want anyone coming at me and repeating that. But we, we have to get past that. We really do. We, we can't just, a lot of times we forgive. We, we don't forget. We forgive. Uh, but we, there's almost, uh, we, we allow the consequence of those negative moments to linger and manifest and build and, and really shape our paradigm. But we have to get back to the drawing board sometimes and ask ourselves, what will it take to fully surrender certain disappointments and discouragements. If we're waiting on divine intervention in the form of a burning bush, it's probably not going to happen. And we're going to miss the opportunities to serve and to love one another, to show and grow up where true breakthrough can happen.
we want it to happen on in comfortable places where we feel close to that refuge. But it's like God is our refuge. We, we try and create this habitat of safety, psychological safety, and I get it. But we have to, at the same time we have to get out there and realize that there's a testing ground. People need to be a part of that testing ground. You can't break through in a vacuum. And I think the church is part of it. It needs to be a training ground we take him into. If this sounds blunt, just again, Noah comes as one pointing the finger at himself. This is a habit I need to be churned in 2022. And I know I'm not alone. Some of you, you may feel helpless and hopeless on the matter in this conversation. But I hope that at least me being willing to share some of what I've gone through prompts a boost for you to stay the course and forgive past offenses. And deflect the lies of the enemy. Sometimes we forgive, and yet somehow we still believe certain lies. Like we compartmentalize, and so it's just, there's reasons why we almost are paralyzed or just despondent. Like for me, I should, I, I feel like I do the right thing, but with just an absence of joy. And it's just like, okay, I feel like I'm almost, again, going through the motions, almost out of self righteous. Like, oh, I sense the self righteousness. I don't want to be a part of this. And sometimes just, again, so easy to feel like you're trapped and to know. When and the only win is to just shut down. But what's helping me lately, among other things, one of them is just to be curious to know what, why I believe what I believe and to follow the white rabbit to a certain distance. And I'm curious to what other people are hindered by, you know, just just wanting to relate in these trying times. As much as we're curious to know what deceptions other people are plagued by, especially as they pertain to us, dare not to hold your destiny hostage. There's a key challenge for you, right? Start that one. Dare to not hold your destiny hostage. Instead, find yourself in Philippians 3, 13, 14 and focus on the next best step. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, that's Philippians 3, 13 through 14. And to quote the great C.S. Lewis, getting over a painful experience is much like crossing monkey bars. You have to let go at some point in order to move forward. So that's really all I have tonight, guys. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it as always. Stay tuned next time when I will take a deeper dive into how we can integrate surrender into our quiet times, fuse it with our curiosity. I know I've said that as a buzzword tonight and apply it relationally. Until then, I pray Jeremiah 10, 23 over you. In the sense, God guides you to his heart to direct your steps. And all you say and do, remember, the way of man is not in himself but in acknowledging and knowing God and discovering him along the journey. (laughs) Why not draw near, be still, and be at peace as you lean into his highest. Selah.